Los Angeles has a long and storied history of violent crimes, and the late 1970s were no exception. During this time, many serial killers operated with impunity in the city, striking fear into the hearts of all who lived there. Two of the most notorious of these killers were the Toolbox Killers, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris, two sadistic and depraved individuals who terrorized the community of Los Angeles for months before eventually being apprehended by law enforcement. The crimes of the Toolbox Killers were particularly heinous and included acts of abduction, rape, torture, and murder that shocked the conscience of the nation. One of the most damning things about this case was a piece of evidence that was so disturbing and graphic that those in the courtroom during their eventual trial were left absolutely traumatized. It also served as a stark reminder of the terrible toll that serial killers can take on a community, and the importance of bringing these monsters to justice. Even though the toolbox killers were eventually caught and brought to trial, the legacy of their crimes is still felt in the Los Angeles area to this day. The city remains haunted by the specter of violent crime, and the toolbox killers as well as others like them serve as a sobering reminder of the dangers that lurk beneath the surface of our society. Hello everybody and welcome to my channel. Today's video we will be discussing the crimes and the victims of the toolbox killers. As I said at the beginning, this video will contain content that is disturbing and not suitable for all viewers and discretion is strongly advised. Other than that, let us open the case file. For us to dive deep into their psyche and understand why they committed these acts, we first have to go into their backgrounds. So let us get into the background of Lawrence Bittaker. Lawrence Sigmund Bittaker was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on September 27, 1940. When he was an infant, he was given up by his mother and adopted by Mr. and Mrs. George Bittaker. His father worked in the aircraft industry, which required him to frequently move around the United States throughout his childhood. Growing up, Bittaker had a habit of playing with fire and was known to have burned down several sheds, and he said he did this as a way to get his adoptive parents' attention. He also stated that at one time, his mother had him stripped down and she proceeded to put out her cigarettes on his body as a form of punishment for burning down the sheds. When he was 12 years old, he was arrested for shoplifting and accumulated charges of the same offense, including petty theft, which brought him to the attention of juvenile authorities. He claimed that these numerous offenses had been, quote, attempts to compensate for the lack of love he received from his adoptive parents. It has also been claimed that when he was little, he got into violent and sexually sadistic behavior as well. An example being that he pulled the teeth out of a rabbit with a set of pliers he stole from his father's toolbox. And he would also sneak out in the middle of the night and break into neighbors' homes and purposely move furniture around. For those wondering, sexual sadism is the act of inflicting pain, torture, humiliation, or fear onto another person to obtain some form of sexual gratification. Reported to have an IQ of 138, Bittaker stated that school was unnecessary and not important, and dropped out of high school shortly before graduating in 1957. It was also reported that when he was growing up, he had no social life, no friends, and not even having a birthday party for himself, or even going to one. And even though he was considered socially awkward, he did state that he had a girlfriend named Mary Ann, who was a Catholic girl that was blonde hair and blue eyed that he would go hiking with in the San Gabriel Mountains. He stated at one point he told her he loved her, to which she didn't reciprocate the same feelings he had for her. And he also stated that he felt a form of rejection from her.
The description of Marianne, the San Gabriel Mountains, and his overall relationship with her is absolutely key to the acts of Lawrence Bittaker and what he would eventually do in the future, which will be explained later in the video. At this time, living in California and within a year of dropping out, he was arrested for car thefts, a hit and run and evading arrest. And for these offenses, he was sent to the California Youth Authority and after being released, he learned that his family disowned him and moved to another state, never seeing them again. Within months of being released, Bittiger soon reverted to a life of crime. He was arrested in Los Angeles for robbery and was sentenced to 15 years imprisonment in May 1961. And while serving this sentence, he was characterized by two psychologists as being, quote, highly manipulative and having a concealed hostility. Bittaker was released on parole in 1963 after only serving two of the 15 years and in October of 1964, he was again arrested for violating parole. He was then analyzed by two psychiatrists and was diagnosed as a borderline psychopath. For those that don't know, the basic definition of a psychopath is a highly manipulative individual who is unable to acknowledge the consequences of their actions. Basically, they know the difference between right and wrong, but they simply don't care. He explained to one of the psychiatrists that his crimes gave him a feeling of self-importance and although he insisted that circumstances pertaining to his upbringing decreased his ability to resist committing his crimes, Bittaker was prescribed antipsychotic medication and was released in May of 1967. It was almost immediately after being released in July, he was again arrested and convicted of auto theft and of leaving the scene of an accident. He was sentenced to five years, but was eventually released in April 1970. In March of 1971, he was again arrested for burglary, and due to repeated parole violations, he was sentenced to serve between six months and 15 years imprisonment in October of 1971. He was released only three years later. In March 1974, Bittaker was arrested and charged with theft and attempted murder after stabbing a Ralph supermarket employee witnessing him trying to steal a pack of steak. He tried to flee but was restrained by two other employees and was quickly arrested. The employee, Gary Louie, survived the stabbing and Bittaker was charged with assault with a deadly weapon and was sent to the California Men's Colony East facility in San Luis Obispo. Bittaker had what is known as a polymorphic perverse personality. Basically, in this case, he could commit any crime off the book imaginable, you name it, anything whatsoever. And it, he didn't care where it brought him. Either a life sentence or even a couple of decades in prison, the only thing he cared about was the sort of high or gratification he received committing these crimes. So that was the background of Mr. Lawrence Bittaker. Very lengthy arrest record, but it is very important for you to know. The man was a severe sociopath and psychopath. He understood the difference between right or wrong, and he simply didn't care. All he cared about was the sexual gratification he received based off of his crimes. That was only one half of the toolbox killers. Now, let us get into the background of Roy Norris. Roy Lewis Norris was born in Greeley, Colorado on February 5, 1948. He was born out of wedlock, and due to the social stigma at the time, his parents had to get married. His father worked in a scrapyard, and his mother was a drug addict. He occasionally lived with his parents growing up, but was repeatedly placed in foster homes throughout the state, and Norris's childhood recollections were interspersed with false accusations of being neglected by the foster families he lived with, such as being denied food and clothing. He also stated he was sexually abused by a Hispanic family, later stating that the prejudice he had against Hispanics originated from his experience with this family. While living with his parents at the age of 16, Norris visited the home of a woman who was in her early 20s and began speaking to her in a sexually aggressive manner. She told him to leave her house and notified his father, who threatened him with a beating. Norris then stole his father's car in fear and drove it into the Rocky Mountains where he attempted to take his own life by trying to inject air into an artery in his arm. 
Police later apprehended him as a runaway and returned him to his parents, where they said that he and his younger sister were unwanted children and that they intended to divorce when they both reached adolescence. A year after this attempt, Norris dropped out of high school and enlisted in the United States Navy, and in 1965, he was stationed in San Diego. In 1969, he was deployed to Vietnam for four months. Even though Roy was deployed to Vietnam, his job kept him away from any sort of danger, such as combat. But while he was over in Vietnam, he was introduced to marijuana and also heroin. It was after he got back from Vietnam that his arrest record really started to pile up, so bear with me, this is important. In November of 1969, Norris was arrested for his first known sexual offenses. He was charged with both rape and assault, with attempt to commit rape, and he was also charged another time for forcing himself into the car of a lone woman. Three months later, in February of 1970, he attempted to enter the home of a woman in Torrance, California. She was able to get a hold of the police before he could do any harm to her. Less than three months later after this offense, Norris was diagnosed by military psychologists with schizoid personality disorder, to which he was given an administrative discharge from the United States Navy under the terms labeled as psychological problems. In May of 1970, Norris attacked a female student on the campus of San Diego State University. He simply approached her without saying a word and struck her with a rock, and then proceeded to bash her head repeatedly into the sidewalk. He was arrested shortly thereafter and charged with assault with a deadly weapon, and sentenced to five years at the Atuscadero State Hospital, where he was classified as a mentally disordered sex offender. He was released from the hospital in 1975, and three months later he stalked a lone 27-year-old woman while on his motorcycle as she was walking home from a restaurant in Redondo Beach. After he offered her a ride and she refused, he got off his bike and grabbed the woman by her scarf. He then dragged her to a set of nearby bushes and raped her. Although the woman reported the rape to the local authorities, they were not able to catch Norris until about a month later when the same woman spotted his bike again and noted the license plate to which she forwarded it to the police. Norris was then arrested and charged, and one year later, he was sentenced with three years to life and sent to the California Men's Colony in San Luis Obispo. It was there that he met Lawrence Bittaker. Do you see why it's important now for us to go into their backgrounds and see how they were brought together? You have two violent and sexually sadistic individuals, and them together in a room only spells recipe for disaster. Fast forward to 1977, and Bittaker and Norris's partnership grows stronger. Whenever they got a chance to be alone, for example, during recreational activities such as constructing jewelry, they discussed plans to kidnap, rape, and murder teenage girls after they were released. This shared fantasy evolved into an elaborate plan to murder one girl each teenage year, ranging from years 13 through 19 years old. The pair then planned to reacquaint themselves after their release. I know what you're thinking. How were these two men able to be released early based off the heinous charges they managed to pile up? Well, these two men were very highly manipulative and they can tell the parole board and also their psychiatrist that they were absolutely fine and that they were rehabilitated. And unfortunately, in the 1970s, the charges of assault and rape weren't as heavy a punishment as they are in today's judicial system. And very soon, this fantasy that they managed to pile up in prison would soon become a reality, as only a few years later, they would be released. In October of 1978, Bittaker was released from the California men's colony and returned to Los Angeles to work as a machinist. This work earned him around $1,000 a week, and despite considering himself a loner, he became friendly with several people in his neighborhood. He earned a reputation from those who knew him as a generous individual who would donate to the Salvation Army, and according to one person, he purchased massive quantities of fast food and handed them out to homeless people in the downtown Los Angeles area. 
His popularity in the area was mostly from the teenage girls who lived around the neighborhood due to the fact that he would store beer and marijuana at his residence at the Scotts Motel in Burbank and invite these girls to hang out at his place. It eventually became a popular hangout spot for teens to socialize. Three months later, in January of 1979, Norris is released and not even a month after leaving San Luis Obispo, he rapes a woman while he's visiting his father in Colorado and simply left her out in the middle of nowhere. Going back to California, he moved back into his mother's home in Redondo Beach and eventually found work as an electrician in Compton. Shortly afterwards, he gets back in contact with Bideker and in late February, they get reacquainted at his place at the Scotts Motel and rekindle their plan to kidnap and murder teenage girls. Over time, the pair began to buy the necessary equipment for them to make their fantasy a reality. The pair decided to buy a van as opposed to a car, so they purchased a silver 1977 GMC Vendura. This van was windowless on one side and had a large sliding passenger door on the other, and according to Bideker, he realized that he and Norris could pull up real close and not have to open the doors all the way which allowed them to make a quick escape. They then nicknamed their van, the Murder Mac. They also added a foldable bed into the van and purchased a toolbox containing ice picks, vice grips, pliers, a screwdriver, and construction tape. They were also equipped with a cooler that was stocked with beer and sodas, a Polaroid camera, police scanners, and walkie-talkies to communicate with each other. Their plans were finally coming together. Between February and June of 1979, Bideker and Norris made practice runs in their van and picked up over 20 female hitchhikers. Fortunately, none of these girls were assaulted. These runs were merely a way for them to develop ruses to lure these girls into the van and of discovering secluded locations. In April, Bideker and Norris discovered a fire road in the San Gabriel Mountains, which is located northeast of Los Angeles. Bideker broke the lock to the gate of the fire road and replaced it to one of his own, so that way they could only have access to it. They also took pictures of unsuspecting teenage girls as they were driving around an area called the Strand. The Strand is a section on the coast of California where Hermosa, Manhattan, and Redondo Beach are connected just west of the Pacific Coast Highway. Hitchhiking was very much part of the culture in the 1970s, and the majority of people in California that hitchhiked were teenagers. Many of them did it to transport themselves over to the beaches and also to hang out with friends. Bideker and Norris use this to their advantage. They have a getaway vehicle to abduct their victims in, and they have the equipment they want to use on their potential victims, and they also have a secluded spot. It's time now for Lawrence Bideker and Roy Norris to turn their fantasy into a reality. Bideker and Norris are driving around the Redondo Beach area of the Strand for almost 15 hours, smoking marijuana and taking photographs of unsuspecting teenage girls when they spot Lucinda Schaefer. Lucinda Cindy Lynn Schaefer was a 16-year-old girl who was walking home early from a meeting at the St. Andrews Presbyterian Church, located on the corner of Avenue D and Pacific Coast Highway to her grandmother's house. She was known as a very bright young woman, and the sweetest, nicest girl you could ever imagine. Her favorite band was Journey, and she tutored in Spanish, algebra, and geometry in high school, and had many friends. She intended to study language in college and teach foreign languages like her mother. She was staying with her grandmother in California for the summer while her mom, Rita, was on a business trip in Tijuana, Mexico. 
She left the church at approximately 7.40 p.m. and proceeded north on Pacific Coast Highway. She then made a right turn on Avenue A and was then approached by Bideker and Norris. They offered her a ride and some marijuana, which she refused. Bideker and Norris proceeded up the road and made a U-turn on South Prospect Drive and pulled up ahead of her as she was walking up the street. Norris then got out of the van and acted like he was working on a light switch on the sliding door. And as she walked by, he grabbed her and she began to scream. Covering her mouth with his hand, he threw her into the van and shut the door, and he then bounded her hands and feet. Bideker, in the driver's seat, cranked the volume to the radio to drown out the sounds of her screams and sped off towards the San Gabriel Mountains. Lucinda was just two blocks away from her grandmother's. The three of them eventually got to the fire road, where she was eventually raped twice by Norris and once by Bideker. Later that evening, Lucinda asked Norris if they were going to kill her, to which he replied, no. And she then asked if that they were, that they allow her to pray. Outside of the van, Bideker and Norris argued for approximately 90 minutes about whether they were going to let her go or murder her and they unfortunately decided on the second option. Lucinda pleaded with Bedeker to allow her to pray, to which he replied, God isn't up here, only devils. He then picked her up to keep her from getting traction while Norris attempted to manually strangle her, and after about 45 seconds, he stopped to the quote, look in her eyes, and ran to the front of the van to throw up picking up his false teeth in the vomit. Bideker then manually strangled her until she collapsed onto the ground and began convulsing. He then got a pair of vice grips and a wire coat hanger and wrapped it around her neck tightly until her convulsing stopped. Her body was then wrapped in a shower curtain and tossed into a canyon so the animals would eat her up and that there wouldn't be any evidence left. Unfortunately, Cindy Schaefer was just the beginning, as in, two weeks later, Bideker and Norris found their next victim. Andrea Joy Hall was an 18-year-old girl from Ohio who had dreams of becoming a flight attendant and traveling the world. She also had an interest of becoming a model or an actress in Hollywood. She was hitchhiking to her boyfriend's house in Torrance, but unfortunately she never made it there. Bideker and Norris were traveling down South Sepulveda Boulevard when they saw her stick her thumb out for a ride, and as they slowed down their van to give her a lift, another vehicle pulled up and did exactly just that, to which she accepted. They followed this vehicle for a few miles down the road, and it eventually dropped her off on the corner of Gould Avenue in South Sepulveda, near Redondo Beach. Realizing she wasn't where she needed to be, she stuck out her thumb again. Seeing this, Norris went to the back of the van and hid under the foldable bed as Bideker pulled up to her and offered her a ride, and she accepted. He told her that there was a cooler in the back with cold drinks and asked her if she wanted one, and as she went to go grab a drink, Norris came out from under the bed and attacked her. Andrea was able to fight off her attacker for some time, and it eventually got bloody. She wasn't going down without a fight. Bideker noticed Andrea was overpowering Norris and slammed on the brakes to throw her off balance. Norris then was able to bound and gag her with construction tape and they proceeded to drive towards the San Gabriel Mountains, where they went to a location beyond where they murdered Cindy. It was here that she was raped twice by Bideker and once by Norris. As she was being accosted by Bideker, Norris spotted what he believed to be headlights approaching their area. 
Bittaker grabbed Andrea and dragged her to a set of bushes as Norris went out to look for the vehicle, and when he returned, they took Andrea to another location further into the mountains. Bittaker took Andrea to a nearby hill, and Norris decided to go into town to buy alcohol. Bittaker forced Andrea to perform sexual acts upon him and took photographs of her with the Polaroid camera he equipped himself with. Being the sadistic monster he is, Bittaker told her, I'm going to kill you, just so that he could take a photo of her in sheer terror and proceeded to have her beg for her life. He then stabbed her in the ear canal with an ice pick. It didn't kill her immediately, and he proceeded to stab her in the other ear and stomped on it until the handle broke off. He then strangled her and tossed her body off the cliff and into a ravine. Bittaker would brag to Norris about the photographs he took of her when he returned. Bittaker and Norris continued to search for more victims after Cindy and Andrea were murdered, and unfortunately, they were able to get to other victims in September of 1979. A month after Andrea's murder, Bittaker and Norris are driving around the Hermosa Beach area of the Strand, where Jackie Gilliam and Leah Lamp catch their eyes sitting on a bus stop on the corner of Pier Avenue and Pacific Coast Highway. Jacqueline Doris Gilliam was a 15-year-old girl that was described by her friends and family as your average girly girl. She had a pink French-styled bedroom, and her favorite song at the time was Shattered by the Rolling Stones. Jacqueline Leah Lamp was 13 years old and was an honor roll student who was about to start freshman year of high school. She had a little brother and two parents that were divorced but remained extremely close to them. Her dream was to go to Hawaii. The two girls were heading to Hermosa Beach when they were offered a ride by Bittaker and Norris. The girls hopped into the van and were offered marijuana by Norris, which they accepted, and almost immediately after getting into the vehicle, the girls noticed that Bittaker turned away from Hermosa Beach and proceeded further into Los Angeles. Bittaker told them he was driving to a secluded spot so they could smoke the marijuana, but the girls weren't buying it. Norris then proceeded to grab a homemade sap with metal pellets from under the bed and hit Leia on the head, knocking her temporarily unconscious. He then began attacking Jackie. As he began binding and gagging her, Leia regained consciousness and opened the van sliding door, screaming. Seeing this, Bittaker got out of the driver's side and ran over to the door and punched Leia in the face and pushed her back into the van. This was witnessed by several people across the street playing on a tennis court, and Bittaker proceeded to tell them that she was having a bad LSD trip and that he was driving her home. Nobody attempted to intervene, and the van drove off towards the San Gabriel Mountains. Nobody at the tennis courts reported to the police that a girl was screaming and got out of a van and then was punched in the face by an older individual. These girls were able to escape, but nobody came forward with that information. Bittaker and Norris kept Jackie and Leah captive for almost two days. Bittaker stated that the reason was partly because it was their Labor Day weekend, and during this time, the two girls were repeatedly sexually abused and physically abused. Bittaker found out at one point that Jackie was a virgin, and he decided to use his tape recorder he had during a time where 
he forced her to pretend that she was his cousin. And Norris then began taking photographs of both the girls nude and posing for pictures alone and with Bideker. On September 5th, Norris stated to Bideker that they should kill Jackie quickly since she was very cooperative, unlike Leah. Bideker replied, no, being that they only die once anyway. Jackie and Leah were then taken to the edge of the ravine on the Lower Monroe Truck Trail and Jackie was then stabbed by Bideker with the ice pick. Leah was hit in the back of the head multiple times with a sledgehammer by Norris until she was dead. Both bodies were then thrown down the ravine. Bideker and Norris got back into the van and returned to Los Angeles to return to work after their long weekend. After Bideker and Norris murdered Jackie and Leah, they attempted to abduct two more women afterwards. On September 27th, a woman named Robin Roebuck was sprayed in the face with pepper spray by Bideker and was raped by both of them. She was unable to get a description of her attackers, but before being assaulted, she was actually able to get a look at the van before being raped. And on September 30th, a woman named Jan Mallon was assaulted and sprayed in the face by Bideker after she parked her car at her apartment complex parking garage. Her screams attracted the attention of bystanders and tenants in the area, which had Norris and Bideker panic, and Norris drove off without Bideker, causing him to flee from the scene on foot. These two attempts will become very crucial points later in the video. Bideker and Norris have murdered four innocent teenage girls, and they are not being seen as suspects by law enforcement. This in turn gives them a boost in confidence, but instead of looking for victims in the Strand area, they proceed up north to the Sunland Tahunga neighborhood of Los Angeles, which is not far from where Bideker is staying in Burbank at the Scotts Motel. I will let you know that this next segment will be very hard to watch and is very, very heartbreaking, so watch at your own discretion. It is Halloween night, and Bideker and Norris are surveying kids trick-or-treating in the Sunland Tahunga neighborhood of California for several hours. There are many festivities and parties to celebrate the time of year, but tonight, they plan to make someone's Halloween nightmare into a reality. At approximately 10.30 p.m., they are flagged down by a lone teenage girl named Shirley Lynette Ledford. Shirley Lynette Ledford was a 16-year-old girl who was described as the perfect daughter. She had a brother a couple of years younger than her, and she attended Verdugo High School with amazing grades. She had a boyfriend and lots of friends, and after school she would work at a McDonald's located on Foothill Boulevard. Her dream was to be a teacher. Lynette had attended a Halloween party with Ruth Torres, her best friend, for around two hours where Lynette eventually got into an argument with her boyfriend, and they got separated at the party. She left the party with Ruth and two boys, and they proceeded to a gas station on the corner of Tuxford Street and Sunland Boulevard. An argument ensued between Lynette and the two boys after they had asked her for money, and she decided to leave the vehicle and hitchhike home. It was almost immediately after she stuck out her thumb, Bideker and Norris pulled up and offered her a ride. Quick note, Bideker and Lynette actually knew each other because he was a frequent visitor to the McDonald's she worked at after school where he would gawk at her and ask her out while she was working. She always turned down his advances.
Knowing a familiar face, she hopped into the van and they pulled away. She gave the directions to where her house was, and instead of going in that direction, they made a turn onto a deserted dirt road somewhere still in the neighborhood. Bittaker then proceeded to push Lynette into the back of the van on top of Norris, where he proceeded to try to bind and gag her. During this struggle, Bittaker came to the back of the van and pulled a knife. Lynette then grabbed the knife blade and cut her finger deeply in the struggle. She was eventually bound with construction tape and Norris took control of the van as Bittaker proceeded to rape and beat her. Not only did he rape and beat her, but he also forced her to scream as loud as she could and violated her with pliers and a screwdriver around her chest and genitals. And he also decided to get a fresh tape for his tape recorder and recorded the whole thing. After some time, Bittaker traded places with Norris and for Norris to get the screams he wanted, he grabbed a sledgehammer from the toolbox and struck Lynette on her elbow, breaking it on the first strike, and then continued to strike it 25 more times with it. They tortured her for several hours. Her final words were, do it, just kill me. Norris granted her plea. Norris grabbed a wire coat hanger and twisted it around her neck until she was dead. But instead of disposing her body in the mountains, Bittaker told Norris that they should dump her body somewhere in the neighborhood so that they could see the reactions of the press and the police. They eventually pulled up to a random house still in the neighborhood and threw her nude lacerated body into the ivy bed of someone's front lawn and drove off. She was discovered in the early morning hours of November 1st by a jogger who thought her body was a leftover Halloween prop. They immediately called the police. The following are actual crime scene photos as well as post-mortem. They are not graphic, but they are upsetting. Lynette had suffered pure hell. She had bruising around the face and breasts, tearing around the genitals and rectum, a shattered elbow, marks around her ankles and wrists from where she was tied up, and a severe cut on the hand that grabbed Bittaker's knife blade. When the police arrived and investigated her body, they found that the wired coat hanger around her neck was wrapped down to the size of a silver dollar. That is how tightly wrapped it was around her neck. The police had no leads. All they had was the body of a teenage girl out in the San Lentejunga area, and nothing was pointing towards Bittaker and Norris. That would soon change, as after a few days after they murdered Lynette, Norris decides to tell one of his prison buddies from a Tuscarora State Mental Hospital, Joseph Jackson, about the murders. Jackson, who he himself is a serial rapist, is so disturbed by what Norris is telling him that he decides to tell his lawyer about the murders, to which... His lawyer tells him to notify the police. Jackson eventually finds Detective Paul Bynum of the Hermosa Beach Police Department. He tells Bynum that Norris murdered these girls to, quote, be able to sleep at night and not worry about being identified. Detective Bynum is given a name, but no legitimate evidence that Norris and Bittaker are the ones responsible for these murders. So, he decides to conduct a rolling surveillance on Roy Norris. On November 20th, Bynum and other police officers follow Norris to a drugstore, and there they find a bag full of marijuana in the passenger seat of his car. One word. Dumbass. This gives them probable cause to search his residence at 313 Garnet Street and arrest him for parole violation. They enter his residence and find more than they expected. Over 500 photographs of unsuspecting teenage girls walking around the Strand area in skimpy bikinis, 
walking home from high school, women's gyms, you name it. They also found heavy amounts of drugs and pieces of jewelry belonging to the victims. Within this pile of photographs, they find a picture of a nude woman from the waist up with her hands behind her head, which that photo is identified to be Jackie Gilliam. As they are proceeding to search his house, the phone rings. The detectives pick up the phone, and it's none other than Lawrence Bittaker. Pretending to be an acquaintance of his, they tell him that Norris is outside fixing his TV antenna, to which Bittaker finds this suspicious. So he hurries out to the van and begins a complete scrub down. He grabs whatever he can get his hands on. Tools, tapes, photographs. And he proceeds to bury them in a nearby cemetery. Back at Norris's residence, the detectives find a Scotts Motel card with Bedeker's name on it, and later that night, Detective Bynum as well as eight Burbank police officers kick in his door, and they find more than what they were expecting. The van was parked outside, and inside of his residence, they found more photographs of unsuspecting teenage girls, drugs, evidence that he forgot to bury, such as the sledgehammer, the pliers, and as well as vials of acid that they intended to use for their next victims. Detective Bynum, eventually, he put the two pieces of the puzzle together and he found out that the description of the van also matched the description of Robin Robeck's assault that she stated to Hermosa Beach months prior. And as they are searching his van, which is practically clean, they stumble upon his tape recorder and they press the eject button. What they found inside would completely change the entire case. What they found inside was the 17 minute audio recording of Lynette Ledford's torture. Bittaker would replay this tape over and over again, days after Lynette was murdered, like he was listening to a podcast or music. And Norris later in a confession stated that Bittaker found the content to be real funny. The tape was literal music to his ears. Both men were taken into police custody and Norris came forward about the murders in a three-hour interrogation by Hermosa Beach Police and retired Los Angeles District Prosecutor Stephen Kay. Kay is a well-experienced prosecutor who also convicted the Manson family back in 1969. He also was the one who convicted Norris for the rape of the Torrance woman, where he was given a sentence of three years to life in January of 1976. Norris asked for a plea deal by Kay for second degree murder to avoid the death penalty, and for this plea to be established, he would have to testify against Bittaker and lead the police to the locations of the murdered four girls in the San Gabriel Mountains. Norris accepted the plea bargain and took law enforcement up to the San Gabriel Mountains to find the remains of the first four girls. And due to the terrain and the rains that were happening in that area at the time, law enforcement wasn't sure if they were going to find anything. But on February 9th, 1980, they got a break. 300 feet down a ravine of the Upper Monroe Truck Trail, and with the help of the Sierra Madre Rescue Team, they found the skeletal remains of Jackie and Leah. The skull of Jackie still had the ice pick embedded in the ear canal, and they found indentations from the sledgehammer on Leah's skull from when Norris struck her with the sledgehammer. And unfortunately, to this day, the remains of Cindy and Andrea have not been recovered.
Seven women and five men today began hearing the case against 40-year-old Lawrence Bittaker, a Burbank machinist. Security was tight. Every spectator was searched by sheriff's deputies before entering Superior Judge Thomas Frederick's courtroom. The man prosecuting Bittaker, Deputy District Attorney Stephen uh, Kay, showed up with a cartload of evidence he plans to present, including a tape recording Bittaker allegedly made while torturing one of his victims. The trial of Lawrence Bittaker began on January 19, 1981, under Judge Thomas Fredericks. Bittaker pled not guilty to the killing of the girls, even stating that he wasn't there when Cindy Schaefer was murdered. He also stated that he paid Andrea Hall $200 for sex and Jackie $600 to pose for the nude photographs he and Norris took of them. He also stated that Lynette Ledford was drug crazed as well. But as he is testifying to all this, he's blaming Norris for all of it, saying that he was the one that murdered all of them. You have to understand in, in cases uh, like this when you have two people that are participating in, in murder, I mean, who else is there but, but those two people? And, and sometimes you, you have to rely on, on one of them and try and make your best determination as to which one is the least culpable and uh, which one's telling the truth. Stephen Kay has described Bittaker as, quote, someone with a 138 IQ, but no form of common sense. The most highlighted moment of the trial was when the audio recording of Lynette Ledford was played in the courtroom. Before it was played, Kay told the jury and witnesses of the trial, for those of you who do not know what hell is like, you will soon find out. The tape is being played. Members of the jury buried their hands in their faces and openly cried. Many people witnessing the trial simply got up and left the courtroom to cry and or even vomit due to what they were hearing. Even the courtroom artist, Elizabeth Williams, left the room while the tape was playing. And as it's playing and Lynette's screams are piercing through the air, Bittaker was seen smiling while looking at a transcript of the recording. I've heard screams before. I didn't, I didn't, I thought I'd be able to sit and listen, but I've never heard anything like that in my life. Uh, I just you? couldn't believe it. I have a daughter and I just, uh, I just could see her and I just, I just couldn't take it. Judge Fredericks calls a recess after the tape is finished and outside of the courtroom and in front of the press, Prosecutor Kay wept. You've heard about this several times before and it still seems to affect you obviously quite deeply. I just picture those girls and how alone they were when they died. I'm sorry. In his opening statement, the prosecutor told the jurors the tape would give them some idea of what hell is like. He was right. From the county courthouse in Torrance, Joe Ramirez, New Center 4. Miss Ledford on the breast with the cold metal pliers. And if you listen to the tape, you'll hear those tire pliers being replaced in the toolbox a few seconds later. Oh, what, what did you touch her on the breast for with a pair of pliers? To shock her with the cold metal. When Prosecutor Steve Kay cross-examined Bittaker, 
Bideker explained that he paid Lynette to scream the way that she did, and also that it was all just pillow talk. But this statement wouldn't change the jury's minds, as the Lynette Ledford torture tape was the final nail in the coffin for Lawrence Bideker. In under 60 seconds, he was found guilty of all charges, which gave him the death penalty. 